Okay, so, so hi Zana. Um, so um, we're going to be talking today about um, how we can uh, mitigate the effects of coronavirus um, for people that are living with and, and facing homelessness. So I'm Francesca Albanese um, and I'm the Head of uh, Research and Evaluation at Crisis and we're a national homelessness charity. I'm Clinical Lead for the King's Health Partners Pathway Homeless Team at the South London and Maudsley, which is a mental health trust and also um, a GP research fellow at UCL Collaborative Centre for Inclusion Health. So um, before we start um, kind of talking to you, Zana, about kind of uh, what's going on at the moment in terms of um, impact on the ground and how this is affecting homeless people, um, I just want to uh, give a, a bit of a definition of what we mean by homelessness um, in this context. So um, we're talking about um, anyone who doesn't have a roof over their head or is living in um, unsuitable and, and temporary accommodation, or, or who may be at immediate, immediate risk of losing their home. Um, so in this, in this case, we're talking about you know, rough sleeping, obviously at the most acute end, vis most visible form of homelessness. But we're also talking about people living in night shelters, hostels, um, and refuges, um, and people living in other forms of unsuitable temporary accommodation, such as bed and breakfasts, um, and particularly in, um, in types of accommodation where people don't have access to shared or do have access to shared facilities and are therefore more at risk and, and can't self-isolate. And we're also talking about um, sofa surfing and people um, who, you know, who may be at immediate risk of losing their home. Um, so um, in terms of the, the outbreak of the coronavirus, I mean, obviously it affects each and every one of us in society. Um, but some people are more exposed to this risk than others, and amongst these are, are, are people experiencing homelessness, and um, particularly rough sleepers. Um, so can you um, sort of talk me through, Zana, kind of why people experiencing homelessness are, are most at risk during this pandemic? Yeah, of course. So there's, there's several reasons um, that contribute. Uh, firstly, we know that people who are experiencing homelessness um, tend to have a, a higher uh, risk of developing chronic diseases at an earlier age so chronic diseases are more common um, and also they tend to be more severe um, and often that's in addition to other problems such as mental illness or addictions problems um, and then there's the the sort of practical issues of um, how do you maintain social distancing lots of people share tents they're in very close proximity to each other maintaining the hygiene measures is you know, almost impossible um, for lots of people, not just those people sleeping on the streets, but as you've articulated, people perhaps who are living in, in shared accommodation or in multiple occupancy or sofa surfing, if they were to become unwell, they have a much higher chance of spreading the illness to others or also contracting it, contracting it themselves. So there are lots of kind of additional vulnerabilities and challenges um, for people experiencing homelessness compared to the general population who are also all at risk as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, some of the things you highlight there um, is why um, we kind of need to protect everyone's health um, in this emergency. Um, and I think particularly, um, you know, there's been an incredible effort going on um, from frontline workers, both in kind of the, the health sector and also the homelessness sector. Um, can you just talk me through kind of what you and your colleagues are, are, are doing on a day to day basis at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. And there's, there's again, there's sort of several layers of things that are happening um, from a primary care perspective. Um, GP practices are still running. Um, I work in a homeless GP, specialist homeless GP practice. And um, although we're seeing less patients, we are giving out phones. So if, if somebody has a calls or, or needs to speak to a doctor, but there's no way of um, contacting them, then we will give them a phone so that we can ring them and do a telephone consultation with them immediately. So that, that morning or that day, um, most of our patients do have phones. So we're able to just speak to them on the phone. Um, we can see a small cohort of patients depending on the symptoms that they're presenting with. Um, in a sort of community-based level, um, services are regrouping so they have hot what are called hot and cold hubs so that patients either with symptoms that that sounds like they are acute and need to be seen immediately can be and and other services such as child health services immunizations those sorts of things and community services like midwifery are also continuing albeit in a slightly different albeit in a slightly different way um, 
in secondary care, they're, they're obviously seeing huge increase in demand at, fr at the front door. Um, so, so patients are still attending hospitals, being admitted where they need to be admitted. Um, so, so there has been you know, a sort of real practical response from the front line, particularly in specialist homeless services, but also more, more broadly to make sure that all patients can access primary and secondary health care. But there's also been the collaborations with the other sectors, such as with, with housing, with social care, with commissioners, to try and find solutions for the range of patients that we're seeing, those who are rough sleeping, those in inappropriate accommodation, those who need to self-isolate um, as a sort of emergency measure. Um, and that, that's, been, um, that's been ongoing really for the last few weeks. I think the response started as soon as possible, as soon as it was possible to start. It's interesting that you're talking about the collaboration aspect there. I know, you know, obviously, and you, you've talked earlier about the need to kind of adapt services. I know that's something we're doing ourselves in terms of our frontline work, making sure people have phones, that we're in contact with people who are socially isolated and, you know, that we're able to get emergency packages to people, whether that's, um, you know, kind of hand sanitizer, soap, or whether it's food parcels. Um, in terms of the kind of collaboration aspect and, and working with other um, with other services and with other sectors, uh, what's working well for you at the moment? And kind of some examples. But are there any barriers that you're facing? And is there anything else that needs to be done to make your your jobs easier and make it more effective? So what's what's really worked well? I mean, we'll probably touch on this in a moment. But as you're probably aware, the the government. Um, and regionally, I, I work in London, so it's the, the Greater London Authority, have been procuring hotels to um, support people who are homeless to have individual rooms so that they can self-isolate. Um, that's obviously posed a lot of challenges in terms of addressing their healthcare needs of quite a big group of, of people in a single place, often with complex needs. Um, but I would say that one of the things that's worked really well is, is the, certainly from the health collaboration, um, substance misuse teams, mental health teams have really stepped up to, um, to supporting the patients within the, the hotel setting. We've all worked together to ensure that patients are getting the specific specialist help that they need. Um, and then working with GP practices wherever they are. Most patients, most people actually are registered with a GP. Where they're not, being able to facilitate that as a temporary registration um, so that people can get emergency medication if they need it or acute medication. And then linking with their existing GPs so that they can send their prescriptions to the local pharmacy, for example, which is a really useful thing to be able to do. And that is, is facilitated through electronic prescribing so patients don't have to do without or go short of their uh, chronic disease medication. So and, and also working with pharmacies to deliver things like substance misuse medication. Very quickly, the substance misuse leads drew up emergency protocols around substance misuse management, mental health management, and that's enabled us to rapidly support patients with things like smoking cessation and, and drug and alcohol addiction um, in the community, perhaps away from their usual services and teams. I think that that collaboration has been particularly successful. In terms of in terms of the challenges, I think you know there are sort of these two competing um, two competing issues: the public health emergency and then the, the housing emergency. The housing emergency has been ongoing, as you know, for a long time, um, and really marrying up of those two and making sure that um, health are embedded within any housing solutions to to ensure that patients, if they're symptomatic, are getting the right. Um, information um, that when they're coming into the uh, into a new housing setting that they're being inducted around uh, hygiene measures, social distancing, um, working with the voluntary sector who are often providing the support for that. Um, so that that has been challenging, but we've developed a number of processes to operationalise that and make it hopefully as safe as possible. Yeah, I mean, I think you mentioned the housing challenges, and I think we've seen some sort of extraordinary measures put in place over the past few weeks. So obviously, and this has been both in terms of, um, you know, in responding immediately to, to people who are, are, are living on the streets and kind of, and people that are in kind of hostile settings, but also um, people who may be at risk of 
Um, so some, some of the things we've obviously seen are the realignment um, of local housing allowance um, to the 30th percentile, which is something you know a lot of the housing and homelessness sector have been calling for for a long time to help people cover the cost of, of, of their rent um, through, through housing benefit. Um, we've also seen a suspension um, of evictions uh, for 90 days and also Section 21 notices um, being kind of extended until September. So obviously these are really positive um, positive things um, and you know in kind of quite an extraordinary kind of uh, communication on Friday that the, the Westminster government put out communication to all local councils in England saying that they needed to um, house all rough sleepers and people living in shared um, facilities and night shelters and hostels um, by last weekend and, and we've seen about 4,000 people sort of move into accommodation so there's clearly a lot of things happening I think um, you know from from crisis's perspective and I know um, you know there are others um, working in this area as well um, you know some of you know while it's great to see this progress it doesn't go far enough and, and there's things that we would like to see um, so happen so you know we think that local authorities more need more specific funding and um, particularly you know you mentioned the support package there around um, doing uh, particularly people who may have drug and alcohol issues you know there's obviously people that are are isolated and have other support needs that if we're moving people into hotels making yeah. sure that 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 package of support is available everywhere and um, that local authorities have um, the funding they need to be able to move quite quickly on this um, i think the other area um, is also thinking around you know we're aware that um you know what we need to see is if we want everyone to be safe in society it means that these measures need to apply to everyone regardless of their immigration status yeah. also around kind of lifting restrictions in terms of um in terms of housing benefit for for people who may not normally get access to it um i think quite interestingly um you know we've seen that local authorities actually um don't need to restrict access access to their services um at the moment um and in Particularly, um, you know, they don't need to apply intentionality rules and local connection rules. Um, and, you know, lots of local authorities are, are kind of uh, taking on board uh, that, that guidance and doing that. But we have heard of cases where people are still being turned away um, for homelessness assistance. And obviously, we know at the moment, you know, that that doesn't need to happen. And also, you know, it's not that's not going to help people if they're not able to access support quite quickly. Um, I think the other area for us, um, which is um, something we need to kind of be mindful of, is obviously the making sure we tackle the root causes of homelessness and making sure more people aren't pushed into into experiencing homelessness so we're seeing obviously the impact um, of coronavirus is having on the on the kind of labor market and people's jobs yeah. people are losing their jobs you know nearly a million people have claimed universal credit since the middle of march um, and you know we we also know that local authorities need sort of things like additional discretionary housing payment um, to make sure that anybody who is at risk of losing their home can get that kind of emergency help and i think the other area is when we're looking at the kind of welfare system to make sure that people aren't being sanctioned um, because you know at the moment people can't look for work and it's just making sure that those sort of restrictions are lifted as well and I just think you know um, I'd, I'd just be interested to hear um, from your perspective perspective in terms of I suppose more in terms of your work and kind of the, the health side um, and linking that to housing and homelessness sort of what else you think needs to be put in play either at the local or national level yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so there's in terms of the the sort of acute um, public health emergency. There's been a lot of activity around that, but uh, you know, discussing with my colleagues, even over the last twenty four hours, now that um, most people. Uh, who are experiencing the most acute forms of, of homelessness um, are being moved into self-contained, some sort of self-contained or self ability to self-isolate type accommodation. We really need to start thinking about their, their uh, both their current and immediate needs, um, but also the long-term plan and, and how they are going to access and, and be housed after this acute crisis. Um, and, you know, my, my suggestion is really that that needs to be thought about within the sort of coming days and probably within the next within the next week the point you make about um, no recourse to you know patients who are, aren't eligible usually for statutory services my experience is that I've seen them housed in this acute setting um, uh, certainly in, in London there hasn't been any um, uh, any exclusion um, for 
of people on that basis. However, again, you know, how long that continues on for to make sure that individuals are being given um, and maintained their rights and entitlements to accessing advocacy and legal support um, and their rights around claiming, um, uh, claiming asylum, um, along with you know, the, the time period that it's going to take for the country to um, stabilise again and for services to kind of return back to normal levels is, is really uncertain. You know, realistically, we're probably looking at a, an extended period of 12 to 18 months. So how that's handled over the next 12 to 18 months also needs careful consideration. Um, you're right in that, in that people are not being... Um, not being uh, marginalised or excluded from uh, immediate and urgent accommodation on the basis of local connection or intentionality, which is a good thing. And I know that it's something that we have advocated for as a key barrier to um, to supporting people with health problems into stable and suitable accommodation. Um, but I think there's a real case to be made around the, the sort of ongoing funding for particularly social care, because there are many, many people, particularly in hospital settings, who have care needs that are beyond those that are going to be managed in these sort of urgent hotel type settings where they need specialist places of care, um, level access accommodation, support around say cognitive impairment or brain injury, um, people who can't return to their sofa surfing because they've been tested positive um, and are therefore homeless for that, for that reason. Um, there, there is literally a whole cohort of people who currently um, need their urgent needs met and then thinking about then all those people who are in emergency um, accommodation how their ongoing needs are going to be met um, and rather than that suddenly coming up upon us in three months or four months when the acute crisis is over that needs to be thought about immediately there is some uh, guidance that's been um, signed off nationally that was authored originally by our story and Professor Andrew Hayward um, that is a guidance looking at how we triage and cohort people who are homeless um, into those with symptom or test positive and those who are high risk of developing complications. And as time goes on, that, that guidance will be updated um, and renewed. It's already gone through several versions accounting for the uh, the very uncertain and unpredictable um, unpredictable situation that we find ourselves in. But as time goes on, that will then need to think about, well, actually, now we've got people in a certain accommodation setting, what is the next step to make sure that then they're safe going forward? And, and also thinking about that in the context of this isn't, you know, I've said it already, but it's important to know that this isn't going to just be a short term issue. We're likely to see peaks and troughs of the virus coming and going over the next year, 18 months. So ensuring that, that everybody is able during that time of, of uncertainty and potentially of, of further outbreaks um, that they're able to then take the measures that they need to to keep their health safe and that in the and that they're also able to get the other physical health mental health and social care support you've probably heard of care for those who are socially excluded it comes as in my head as four four pillars of, of inclusion health um, housing and places of care that meet the needs of everybody in the community health and social care that is available and accessible and also meets meets the needs um, of everyone in the community income um, or, or benefits that allow people to live with dignity um, and and then tailored support for everyone that needs it and that means that it, it's meeting those needs at that time which might well be changing and health in that is is just one pillar without the other things actually it makes the healthcare bit quite difficult quite difficult to do which is why we've always taken this very broad and inclusive approach to working across sectors and and with partners in in all different aspects of the care of, of an individual yeah, I mean, I think you make a really uh, good point there in terms of the four pillars. And I think it's making sure that, you know, yes, there's, there's, it, there is the health part, but there's obviously the kind of wider support structures and housing is a key pillar in that. And I think this brings me on to my, my last question, really, which is around, you know, what should we be doing to make sure that when the emergency is over and, and taking the point that you made around, you know, this isn't going to just end, we're going to see peaks and troughs. But I think, you know, how do we make sure we don't go back to the status quo where we have, you know, thousands of people 
uh, sleeping on our streets at night. You know, we have hostels with huge waiting lists. We have people stuck in temporary accommodation, you know, making sure that actually, you know, we've seen some very kind of big policy measures put in place quite quickly. Um, you know, lots of those we've been calling for anyway. Um, and I think, you know, this is a real opportunity that we don't discharge people from hotels back to the street. But no. to do that, we need a kind of inclusive housing system to be designed. And that means, you know, we need so investment in social housing. You know, we need grant funding for that. We need kind of, um, you know, that needs to come from um, being, it being properly subsidized as well as obviously uh, looking at, pr at private development, you know. Um, some we we also need a, a kind of welfare system and particularly housing benefits that's going to cover the cost of rent long term and um, you know we you know you talked about um the kind of tailored package of support you know that's an ongoing need for many people we've seen some things like housing first come in you know think we need, we need that to be kind of rolled out um at, at a national scale um, and i think you know we need to make sure that everybody at the moment who's finding themselves in um in hotel accommodation, in emergency accommodation, has a personalised plan to make sure that they don't go back onto the streets and that suitable, stable and affordable accommodation is found for them. And I think, you know, we know it's possible. Um, these are all policy choices. Um, you know, we can make the right policy choices and we can make sure that we, we do the right thing and then we ensure that we end homelessness um, in the kind of long term and that it isn't just emergency measures. Um, I mean, is there anything else kind of over and above that, Zana, that you think needs to be thought about in terms of a long term plan? I think you've touched on the majority of it, actually, Francesca. Um, all those policy decisions still need to be taken. Um, obviously, one of the biggest issues is, is, is just a lack of affordable housing. It's really good news that the, the um, that the housing benefit has been increased to that 30% threshold because without that it would just be an impossible cycle that we would find ourselves in but the lack of availability of housing continues to be a key problem and there does need to be a, a policy decision made to create many many more um, uh, social housing developments um, that can meet the needs of, of all the people in our communities that need that, need that. It's one of my key concerns is, is the, the sort of decanting of, of hotels back onto the streets or back into insecure and temporary accommodation. This should be seen as an opportunity to make sure that everyone who's vulnerable gets the right sort of accommodation that they need. Whether mm. that can be deployed quickly enough um, in this acute setting, I don't, I don't know, um, but it certainly needs to be taken account of because otherwise you'll just create a situation where you're back within that same emergency cycle again. And that's neither good for the public, nor is it, it good sort of economically or financially. It makes much more sense to ensure that people are able to live with dignity and live safely and health, healthily than it does to continually go around these sort of emergency cycles. Um, so I, I think that there has to be some consideration. It has to be quite, it has to be quite soon, probably in the next few weeks about how that's going, how that's going to be managed. I know that we we're all thinking about it at this point. The idea of personalised plans, I think, is really good, really important. Um, and beginning to make those details sense, not just housing, but housing, at this point will then allow them to be able to, to make um, applications for the right sort of housing in the coming in the coming weeks. Because it will be, it will be weeks. This peak will last uh, a short period of time. Um, six, eight weeks, and then and then we'll be seeing hopefully a decline, and then you know we don't know what's then going to happen in in the winter um, or come the autumn. There may well be another another spike. So by that point, really, we need to have the right uh, solutions for for the longer term, rather than a cycle of emergency solutions. If that makes sense. Yeah, completely makes sense. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Zana. I've really enjoyed the conversation. And I think, you know, I think that the two key points there that you make is, you know, everyone should be treated with dignity and respect and everyone should have a safe and stable home. And I think, you know, they're the two kind of kind of overarching messages, really, in terms of how we kind of, um, you know, 
plan for the current kind of emergency but also thinking longer term in terms of um, you know how we tackle the issue um, of homelessness and also making sure that inclusion health is part of that. Thank you Francesca.